of all of the controversial things that Andrew Tate has said and the things that I disagree with him on, this is probably the most controversial and the thing that I also most agree with him on. And it's a statement that he says that depression isn't real. And so you might be thinking to yourself, maybe you or definitely somebody you know, at least is suffering depression. You're like, I've seen it. Like it's real, right? <laughs> like that's not normal for that person to be acting like that. So before I start this video and my explanation as to why I believe Andrew Tate when he says that, I totally agree with him. And I think there's actually a lot of evidence. Most of the evidence is on his and my side, which I'll present here in this video. Um, I don't want to diminish anybody's experience, right? Like if you are genuinely very depressed, you're cynical about life, or you know anybody who's actually really felt any sort of depression like I have, it's not that you feel sad or mad or worried. A lot of times you just feel nothing. You're just, there's a French word for, for it. It's called ennui, which is a sense of just feel like feeling nothing at all, right? Listlessness. And so depression can come in many forms. Uh, the worst form, I think, is that where you feel nothing at all, right? But you could also feel very sad and um, anxious. Those are aspects of it too. So I'm not diminishing that at all. I have no doubt that you or the person who has had depression that's close to you has experienced that, all right? I, I genuinely want to offer some sort of solution here because I just don't think that sedating yourself with pills does anything or does do something, but it's just not the right path to go through. It's a very expedient way to numb your pain temporarily. And then that makes a great makes you have a greater pain that you push, you know, you kick the can down the road. I'll get to that in a second. All right. Um, so first off, who am I to be talking about this type of stuff? You know, I've I've went through many depressive episodes. Um, bipolar disorder runs in my family. I'm pretty sure I have it too. Not super bad, but I definitely have these manic and depressive episodes. I think a lot of creative people, um, and I come from a very creative family, tend to have <laughs> something like that, right? So trust me, I understand what depression feels like. And I've, you know, dealt with it in family members. And to add to that, I have a lot of friends who, you know, they've gone to therapy, they've gotten pills subscribed to them or prescribed to them, I should say, through their psychiatrists. And sometimes they get better. Sometimes they get a lot worse, but typically it's not something that they ever really overcome. And, you know, with my background, just, uh, and when I say my background, I mean, philosophy, I really think a lot of this stuff <clears throat> and a lot of the discussion around depression is just due to bad philosophy, which I'll get to in a second. All right. Um, so anyway, I just want to preface all of that first. So the first thing, when the first common thing that I hear when people say, oh, of course, depression is real. There's a chemical imbalance in your brain. It's like, yeah, <laughs> that's why you feel so bad. I have no doubt that the chemical imbalance exists. What I do doubt is the cause of that chemical imbalance. All right. Now, of course, there are going to be some genetic factors to it such as having bipolar disorder running in your family, which it does in mine. Um, but so, so that's, that's one cause that you can't really change. Of course, you can tailor your environment to make sure that you feel the best that you can. Um, and again, I'll get to that in a second. You'll, you'll be hearing me say a lot in this video because I have a lot to cover, all right? I think a good place to start off talking about this is to see if there's just ask the question if there's any sort of utility in depression or feeling depressed, because obviously that trait, and like I said, with the example of bipolar disorder in terms of my own family, why would that trait or any other traits that lead to depression be sexually selected for or naturally selected for over time? Like what's the utility in it? And I think the the answer to that's really quite obvious. It just comes down to survival. So let's say that you're, uh, I don't know, a caveman like 20,000 years ago. Your whole family's dead um, and you're completely alone and you have nobody around you. You're going to feel depressed probably, right? So what that feeling of depression what does that tell you to do? 
oh, I feel depressed. I have nobody around me. Uh, I need to find a tribe. Why does your psychology scream at you to to do that? Because especially 20,000 years ago, if you didn't have a tribe, you're going to die, <laughs> right? And then that feeling of anxiety, that loneliness that happens there too. You're going to die if you don't have that. And if we look in the modern day, when people are depressed, we're in a very artificial environment that hasn't existed for 99.9999% of human history, right? We're still not evolved and we're not used to, and maybe we never will, at least in our lifetimes, definitely won't, of being used to things like social media, where you interact with people without actually seeing them. Uh, you work in these environments with these artificial lights. Like right now, I have a computer screen right in front of me, right? There's an artificial light coming through here. You're viewing me through that platform as well. You're viewing me through a 2D surface. These things are completely unnatural. They're weird to us, you know? And evolution can can happen quite fast, actually. But I still don't think that we're like evolved to really be used to this type of stuff. So, so that's one thing. And I think another thing, too, that people don't talk about enough and I saw this actually from a post from Chris Williamson, the podcaster, the Modern Wisdom podcast. And he talked about the importance of anticipation. And anticipation is the thing that uh, spikes your dopamine when you're watching porn, for example. <laughs> and the reason it just fries your dopamine receptors is because it's not actually like the moment where you blam. <laughs> if I'm Trying to be less crass about it. If you, when you blam, I just try to make it funny. Um, so the moment you blam, that's actually what's driving. That's more oxytocin. That feeling, that good feeling of like ah, after you, you know, blam, you know. But the everything leading up to it, the anticipation, the excitement, that's the dopamine. So because you're anticipating something, right? And so you know, it's kind of a trite saying, but I think it's true when people say, "Oh, don't." it's not about the destination it's about the journey well yeah because that's where the the dopamine is is the anticipation of reaching the destination right it's the same reason that if i just if you just started watching a movie and then we just fast forwarded to the ending you wouldn't really enjoy it right the enjoying the the part of the enjoyment is the anticipation of what's going to happen throughout the course of the film and if you look at your life in the same exact way, what is there to be excited about for most people? Most people have nothing to look forward to. There's no, not only do they not have something to look forward to, because that sort of presupposes that there's some final ending that you should have in mind. This is pretty, this is going to sound quite counterintuitive, but I think the journey of life is to not have it an end goal. If I were to ask you, I, I saw this reality show pretty recently. And somebody was like, oh, well, you know, one time I was told that you should look 50 years into the future and work backwards from there. I thought it was the dumbest advice I've ever heard because <laughs> logically it makes sense, right? Logically, it makes sense. But you have no idea what 50 year old you is going to like, or in his case, you know, 70 year old him is going to like. There is this uh, philosopher, Heraclitus, I talked about him in earlier videos, but he believed that everything was fire. And this guy existed even before Socrates. So, um, but anyway, so when he said everything is fire, fire can change all the time. It's very malleable, right? It can be a small fire, small ember. It can grow to be large, bright, and it's constantly changing shape and form. And we humans are the same exact way. If you really look at your life, especially if you're young, your values are, are changing all the time. You're, ideally, you have some core values that stay the same so that you don't live in this very chaotic world constantly, but your values are always shifting and changing and molding, right? And if you have something, and this is where most people unfortunately get caught in that corporate trap where they say, oh, well, I want to, when I'm 65, I want to retire and make sure that I have, you know, my 401k and social security, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like, you're you're looking too far into the future where you just assume one that that's even practically going to be possible with the material circumstances that we're in now probably not but two um you just assume that that's something that you're going to enjoy when you get to that point and i think a lot of people and you know my um my grandpa he lives in a retirement community 
um, you know, he has his own little house there and everything. He's self-sustaining, so that's good. It's not like he's in a retirement home or anything like that. But there's people who just work hard their entire lives and say, yes, I can't wait to just join this retirement community and just chill the rest of my life. And then they die. They die very quickly, especially the men. They die within like six months a lot of times because they just built their whole entire lives around getting to that one point. They're there. Their sense of anticipation is gone, right? What do they have left to keep going for? And so my grandpa, he still has like a side business where he's making like woodworking type stuff and selling them online. And he has that to look forward to. So that's why he's been retired for quite a while now, but he's still a happy guy. He's, you know, doing quite well considering his age and, you know, his past health issues. It's like, that's a perfect example right there of how, okay, those people, maybe they don't, are they, maybe they're not clinically depressed, but it makes sense that their sort of spirit dies because there's nothing to look forward to anymore. I want to cover another point before somebody probably points it out of, oh, well, how do you explain, if depression isn't real, how do you explain all of these rich, famous people who end up killing themselves or just rich people as a whole? Why would they kill themselves? Their lives are great. I, like I said earlier, this is where philosophy comes in. This is just bad philosophy. From the standpoint of you just assume, you're assuming values. You're projecting your own values and your own wants and needs based off what you currently don't have in your life. You project it onto other people and assume that that's the same thing that they value. So let's take, for example, um, Robin Williams. Right, he's a pretty famous example of somebody who offed himself, who had technically had it all, right? Fame, fortune. Um, but like obviously those two things aren't enough. I think a lot of people understand that. But I think also one thing that people don't really talk about, like I said or said earlier, it's anticipation. Somebody who's at the top of the mountain and he's worked his entire life and molded his entire personality to get to the top of the mountain, when there's no more mountains to climb. What do you think is going to happen to them? <laughs> like their whole life has been struggling and climbing up the mountain. And that gave them in a weird way, it gave them pleasure and joy. Obviously, there's a lot of hardship involved with that, but at least they were on a mission. They were doing something right. And so similar to the retirees who end up dying early for like no reason because their spirits decay. It's the same thing that happens to those people at the top. There's nothing left to overcome. and. Well, this is where Nietzsche comes in. <laughs> it's impossible to go through one of my videos without me mentioning him. But his whole thing is he believed that the will to power was basically the central drive behind everything, but especially human beings. And so what he thought was the purpose, if there was a purpose of humans, I'm not saying that he had a teleological approach to it. If you don't know what that means, uh, I'll explain in another video, but you can look it up really quickly. It just basically just means, means that like something has a purpose, you know, anyway. Um, so he believed that the nature of humans is to overcome themselves and become better. And that's the thing that not, not only makes us happier, but that's the thing that makes us to be proud to be human, which then makes us happier, right? Happier, more fulfilled. That's just in our nature. That's just kind of who we are is one who overcomes. That's the whole idea of the Ubermensch, for example, and the higher men that lead, pave the way to the Ubermensch. And so if you don't have things that you're constantly overcoming, especially as a man, and you have sort of the set path out for you, which is what society has molded you, uh, especially in the U.S., has molded you to think about and to, to, to be on that path, right? So you go through elementary school, then middle school, then high school, then then everybody's like, which college are you going to? Well, I'm going to this college. What are you majoring? Oh, I guess I'm majoring this. Well, you know, the mess, The next step after college is you get a job, right? Or you, you intern during college and then you get a job. Okay, yeah. And then if you do this and then you go on this track, eventually over time, you'll make a decent amount of money and then you'll be able to retire and then just enjoy your life. Where it's too predictable. There's no challenge in that. And I know it's like a, I guess maybe cash 22 is the right way to put it. Maybe not, but like people want to have a good life, but they also don't want to have conflict in their lives. And I fundamentally believe that, especially as men, you need some sort of conflict and struggle to be happy. 
You just do. And I'm a perfect example of that. I've went through a lot of that stuff in my 20s. And a lot of people will look at my 20s and be like, damn, you had it rough, man. And I'll be like, yeah, but I am filled with gratitude. And I love my life. And I wouldn't have it any other way. And why is that? Again, it's because I had all these conflicts and struggles in my 20s. And it made life feel meaningful. You know what I mean? It's hard to have that if you're just on a predictable life path constantly. And so when I say that, when people look at rich people, rich, famous people getting depressed, that it's just bad philosophy, typically all you're doing is you're just projecting things that are missing in your life onto them. And typically those people, they're further along on the race, right? It's like, like to, to use the mountain analogy again, if you're, at, if you're climbing up the mountain, and all you care about is getting to the top of the mountain, you cannot help but think that the people at the top of the mountain have it good, right? But then you don't realize, again, that you've changed fundamentally as a person to the point where when you're at the top of the mountain, you're a mountain climber, right? Imagine you get to the top of the mountain, you're a mountain climber, that's your passion, and you're not allowed to climb, climb mountains ever again anymore. You're probably going to feel depressed, right? So anyway, look, I think it's possible, sure. I'm open to the idea that despite all of these things, despite having uh, a lot of things to look forward to, despite having a life where you're constantly overcoming obstacles, uh, you know, the you have a life where you're able to sort of feel your own power, right? If we're talking in a Nietzschean sense, that you still have this chemical imbalance and that you're still depressed. I'm willing to acknowledge that that might be the case, okay? Um. I, and if that is the case, yes, like if your psychiatrist goes through all those things and they actually have studied philosophy and can talk about the topics that I just talked about now, which is why I think a lot of medical doctors should be forced to, to study philosophy, <laughs> um, which to psychologists credits a lot, uh, especially clinical psychologists, a lot of them do. So that's good. Um, if you get to that point, then yeah, maybe pills make sense. Maybe it makes sense to try it. I just think that the vast majority of people who are pill poppers, just sedating themselves, they're living lives that it makes sense for them to be depressed. Based on all the other things that I talked about, it makes sense that they they should be depressed, right? It's their bodies and their spirit and their minds screaming at them that to get out of that situation. And for me... When I'm in the West, when I'm in America, I start to get depressed too. I've been, I've started to feel that way being here for longer than I expected. But then for me, when I'm in the right environment along the beach in Southeast Asia with my nice little community there and playing beach volleyball and having good friends around my girlfriend, not, not having to stress and worry about, you know, like money all the time, magically. It's kind of weird. Magically, I feel way better and life is amazing. <laughs> I wonder why that is. It's tough to change your environment. I get that. But that's the key to, that is the key to curing your depression. It's way more key than popping pills, man. So, so much of the depression that you feel, it's real, but it's your body telling you you need to change. All right. And if at that point, you still need to take pills because you're still feeling bad, fine. But I'm willing to bet the vast majority of everybody who claims to have depression has not gone that far. They just haven't. Well, let me know your thoughts on this video. I'm anticipating some hate comments here and there, but uh, keep in mind, I'm, this video is to try to help you, okay? Um because I know for myself, and I've noticed this with family members and friends, that when they buy into the lie that depression is real and that they should take pills to cure their depression, things just get worse. Well, thanks for watching.